first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Air Chief for gracing this occasion, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It's an honor and a privilege for our forum, you know, to have the opportunity to host you, sir. Uh, before I start my question and answer session with the Air Chief, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, Operation Kaveri is happening, you're all aware. So, 40 kilometers away from the actual place where the war is going on, at night, the Indian Air Force landed its planes in a place called Khartoum and started the evacuation process of Indians, done very, very professionally. A very big hand for the Indian Air Force, please. And uh, after this session, if you have any questions uh, regarding the evacuation, you may like to ask the chief. Right. So the first question is, uh, sir, with your permission, sir. Yep. You've spoken about the Indian Air Force and how it needs to become an Indian Air and Space Force, sir. So are there natural linkages for this transformation? That's one, sir. Number two, do you look at the air and space medium to be one common continuum? There's no doubt uh, on the second part where you, you know air and space are considered as one continuum. Because anything that you launch into space has to go through the medium of air. And anything that comes back also has to come back through the medium of air. So there is no doubt in the fact that we have to consider them as one continuum. The similarities between the two domains are also far too many to be ignored. For example, the ability to maneuver in three dimensions, the longer reach, the precision, which are typical characteristics of air power are also evident in space power abilities. So therefore, it is uh, uh, it behoves on us to now look at the future and maybe even emulate some other nations what they've done to uh, get the air and space part together under one domain, under one organization. So I think the future lies in uh, you know accepting the fact that it is one continuum and we have to work in tandem with each other. Though there's no denying the fact that the space applications and utilities will be used across all domains, not just the air domain. The major users will be the military, the army, the navy, and all other uh, civilian users will use the uh, space applications. But the fact that space control and um, control of objects and you know um, assessment of the location, space situational awareness is all sort of an extension of the air domain awareness. Therefore, I'm quite certain and I can say with a lot of emphasis that they have to be considered as one continuum. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, the Indian Air Force has recently uh, revised this doctrine. And what are the salient changes and why uh, was there need to revise the doctrine? Because uh, many felt that the, the older one was working fine. So what are the new things that led to the uh, revision of this doctrine, sir, the Air Force? Uh, let me take you back to um, almost uh, three decades ago when we issued our first doctrine in 1995. So that doctrine was meant to sort of educate internally within the Air Force the strengths of air power, how air power can be utilized, what are the typical characteristics of um, the air power and how we can operate jointly with other services. Thereafter, a decade later, somewhere in 2007, we realized the need to revise, revisit and revise the uh, air power concepts because of the changing technology, the changing geopolitical situation and so on. So we issued a second revision sometime in 2007. Till then, our doctrine were uh, classified um, documents which are accessible only to people within the Air Force. So in 2012, we sort of updated the 2007 doctrine and put it out in the public domain for the first time. So it was available to all the uh, national security apparatus, the practitioners of air power, the academia, everybody else had access to the air power doctrine. Now, 10 years down the line, we've realized that they have been many catalysts for uh, which demanded a change in a uh, revision of the doctrine. Firstly, of course, is the changing geopolitical situation. More importantly is the technology. The way technology has revolutionized the way modern wars are going to be fought, it is very incumbent on us to incorporate that in our doctrine. The third is the capability of the adversaries. We all are aware of the growing capability of the adversaries in our subcontinent and we have to factor that in. And uh, I think most important is the previous editions of doctrine did not cover the gray zone operations or what we call 
no war, no peace operations. So this uh, doctrine has a chapter dedicated to no war, no peace operations. And it also considers all the emerging domains of warfare with a lot of emphasis on space, cyber, and on multi-domain operations. And uh, here I would like to uh, highlight the fact that every chapter in our doctrine, almost every page talks about joint operations, though it's an Air Force doctrine, but it emphasizes on joint operations. Excellent, sir. Uh, sir, again, coming back to the operational doctrine, you know, it, uh, it talks about how the IAF from an air power becomes, uh, sir, an aerospace power, you know, sir, in the backdrop of continuously changing rules of global for, uh, warfare and technology advancements and all that, sir. How do you see the IAF adapting itself to the new operating environment in the future, sir? I, I told you, now the space domain will percolate and it will have its effects across all other domains of warfare today. Like cyber, it, it is all encompassing. It will have an effect on the uh, operations and the capabilities of all the three services. The, uh, there's no doubt that space utilities and applications will enhance the uh, capability of the Army and the Navy. But for the Air Force, I can say that there will be a little extra enhancement in the capabilities purely by the fact that some of the roles and missions carried out by the Air Force, the Air Power, have now been taken over by the Space Power. To quote an example, you know, our strategic reconnaissance capability in the 80s and 90s and 2000s was based on one strategic um, recce aircraft that we had, the MiG-25, the trisonic aircraft, which used sure. to fly uh, stratospheric levels to meet the demands of the three services for reconnaissance. Now, this role has been completely taken over by space. Similarly, we foresee that in future, there will be some air power roles which will merge into the space power roles. Therefore, I, it is once again uh, important that we understand the fact that we cannot uh, divide these two into two separate powers and we have to start looking at them as one congruous uh, power. Sir, uh, sir, traditionally, sir, uh, as far as space is concerned, it was always considered peaceful. People going to space, humans in space, sir, humans landing on the moon, all this was with the backdrop of you know, scientific inquiry, scientific achievement, exploration. Now we're talking about weaponization of space. So that is another new factor which is coming up, weaponization of space. So my question is, sir, how do you look at this transition? And uh, what will be its effects in future conflicts? Because we, now we are talking about actually fighting in space with our adversaries. How do you look at this? Well, what you said is um, correct that uh, the space applications initially were developed purely for uh, civilian use. And um, they, have def they have made a huge change in the way uh, the applications can be utilized right across every field that you can think of. But I think uh, you may not be wholly correct when you say that they, were, they started with civilian uh, applications. Because the first uh, object which went into space, I think, was the V-2 rocket, so, uh, the uh, German V-2 rocket, which touched near space and came back. So militarization of space had started uh, simultaneously along with the civilian usage. In fact, the first uh, few space missions by the Soviet unions were all, I think, controlled by the Ministry of Defense because they had in mind that the applications will be purely used for defense purposes. So uh, while there is no denying that uh, the applications can be used by everybody, the militarization of space is happening. We are aware because of the uh, infinite possibilities it affords us as men and women in uniform, to exploit the capabilities of all the assets that are there. Whether it is PNT, whether it is ISR, whether it is communication, everything is going to enhance our capability. So, uh, so uh, we talk about capabilities, sir, and the doctrine also, the operational doctrine of the Indian Air Force, the latest one, sir. So, uh, what capabilities does the Air Force need, actually, to play a pivotal role, sir, when we talk about the space domain? We have a current level of capability today. We are talking tomorrow about space doctrine. So what is the jump that you see? What is the increase in capability that you would like the IAF to have, sir? Uh, I, I would not uh, like to start with what the Indian Air Force would like to have. But you just mentioned this word space doctrine. This, yes. has, this will be a national doctrine. And it will have um, elements of uh, primarily the civilian usage of space. Sure. And uh, I, I think there will be an element of the uh, military doctrine as a part of it. Sure. And uh, here is where the Indian Air Force will be called upon in future, I would look at, 
for um, taking part in space situational awareness, space denial uh, exercises or space control exercises. And uh, I, I think with, uh, there is a lot of similarity in the kind of um, air control and air denial exercises that we do. So the expertise is there. What we need to now start looking at is continuing to build up on our human resources capital to gain expertise in this field. We have to admit that even within the services, there are not too many people who are very versed with, well versed with space uh, awareness and exploitation of all avenues that uh, space uh, efforts us. So, so it is very important that while we work on a space doctrine, we parallelly need to work on educating uh, a lot of people on space applications. Absolutely, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my question to you now, sir, relating to space itself, sir, and the air, aerospace force. The question is, how do you see the future structure developing, especially with respect to Indian Air and Space Force and the DSA? So you have a DSA also, yeah. sir. How do you see that, sir? So the, the DSA, as you're aware, is a tri-services establishment. Sir. It's a um, nascent agency as of now, which uh, tries to um, aggregate the resources available within the three services and it serves as a link between the Indian Space Resource Association as an organization and the new entities that have been formed now after the space policy. Also, I mean, I'll allude to the Indian space policy which has just been issued. So a uh, lot of significance now to uh, interact with the NSIL or the in space. So all this functional, uh, this functionality will be done by the DSA. So when you talk about the uh, Indian Space Force or Indian Air and Space Force, I would like to just draw a parallel to the uh, some other nations in the world, the American Air Force, the French Air Force, they all started with having a space command initially, akin to what we have got, the Defense Space Agency. And then as it grew, it merged into their air forces to become the uh, French Air and Space Force. The United States Air Force thereafter then created a new uh, branch of the military called the uh, United Space Air Force, sorry, the United States Space Force. So it's a new branch completely, but that is many years from now. We had started this uh, first step of setting up the Defense Space Agency and uh, we are putting our um, weight behind it to ensure that it grows as our prowess grows in the space. Uh, so we talk about multi-domain operations, sir. And we have seen an increasing role of the space domain. I'm coming back to space again and again, sir, because that is of uh, an area of interest, sir. Can you bring out the key roles of space in modern war fighting and how it will continue to be the ultimate high ground, sir? It, the fundamental utilization of space for military use right now is in three domains. The ISR, position navigation, timekeeping, and communications. All these have seen a quantum jump in the capabilities in the last one decade. Like I mentioned to you, we were dependent on aerial assets for carrying out recce. Today we have uh, space-based uh, space assets, which are giving us submetric resolution. What we need to do now, the enhance the revisit times, enhance the persistence, enhance the number of uh, space objects in, uh, in orbit to give us a continuous surveillance over the desired area of interest. So that is one area. The second is, of course, communications. Initially, we were just looking at uh, long-range communications through the means of satellites. Today, our aircraft are equipped with software-defined radios. Huge amount of data exchange takes place. But primarily, it is line of sight in the air. Now, with the uh, use of space-based assets, we can extend this to a, a global reach where two aircraft can exchange data through the means of an, uh, a satellite communication. So the, uh, it's only up to our imagination as to what, uh, how we can exploit the available capabilities and the futuristic capabilities. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I come uh, to the end Thank of the you. fireside chat uh, <laughs> with the chief. Uh, should you have any questions, please feel free. And my, my only request is, my only request is, you know, uh, please ask one question at a time because if you ask A, B, and C, then it becomes very long. So kindly stick to one question, please. So, Bipindra. So, Bipindra, yes, sir, from Defense Capital. Uh, so, this uh, Russia-Ukraine war, it's kind of being described as the first commercial space war. Uh, do you see, I mean, with the space sector opening up for the private sector in India, do you see the private sector playing a key role in uh, the aerospace command or the aerospace force, the air and space force that you're talking about at this point in time? And what will be the kind of role that 
the private players would have in that scenario i think um, the democratization of space through the new policies issued in the last one or two years is the biggest revolution that has taken place in our environment so uh, it definitely has opened up the avenues for private players to come in and um, now sky is the limit or space is the limit to see where we can uh, integrate their capabilities with our requirements good afternoon sir major i am major krishnan a veteran when you spoke about the new air force doctrine you spoke about joint operations and one of the advantages that we expect will accrue from joint operations is elimination of duplication of effort and assets and also secondly uh, we expect that assets should be allocated based on the area of responsibility and the domain in which the force is expected to cause effect so how differently does the indian air force use attack helicopters uh, from the way that the indian army uses attack helicopters uh you know we firstly i would not look at assets when it comes to um, you know the ultimate goal of what the armed forces are meant to do i would like to look at the effects what effects do we desire if the effects are to carry out extensive uh, air interdiction or to carry out deep strikes or to carry out any other thing then then we'll decide what are the platforms to be used and exploitation of the platform will is always based not only on the capability but also on the um, situational uh, you know the situation that occurs at any given time it is very dynamic i cannot say that i will lock in this asset only for this particular role it will not be used for anything else that's a criminal waste of assets and my dear it is not i'm not talking about air force assets or army or navy assets these are national assets so in our concept of operations which flow from our doctrine we have given guidelines as to how to capitalize on all the assets available with all the three services to deliver a strong punch where required so it is the effects that we are looking at and not on the assets may i ask a follow up yeah so if you look at the assets that we are focusing on platform like the attack helicopter if we are, if it is a effect that we are focusing on a platform like the attack helicopter would be close to medium interdiction which role is predominantly uh, you know done by the land forces so i am trying to understand how differently would the air force apply the same to and what different effect is expected to achieve uh, uh, you know i would really not like to discuss tactics here because it is amount it tantamounts to discussing tactics how i am going to utilize the attack helicopters but suffice to say that uh, the platforms have got adequate capability to be used in every role in every terrain and not just for medium interdiction there are plans afoot to utilize them in in roles that possibly you cannot imagine and i would like not like to disclose my cards here good afternoon uh, air chief uh, i am general saxenath uh, former dg army air defense and thanks for your insight i want to uh, draw a point on the counter hypersonic capability the chief is well aware how the hypersonic threat is growing in our domain and how we need to slowly develop the counter hypersonic capability in which your uh, uh, insight on the air and space force becomes very handy and in that the global look see capability in trying to detect the hypersonic weapon the world over is integrating the space sensors with leo sensors and also having a distributed architecture of surveillance based on drones based on high altitude platform systems and connecting upward to the satellites so as the chief just brought out uh, are you looking into this area of capability building uh, and connecting it up with the kill means which uh, the drdo chief hinted upon Uh, as to directed energy weapons, which are today very heavy, very bulky, they are not able to be uh, effective in the time frame and in the area where the hypersonic missiles and glide vehicles could be. The whole world is struggling on it uh, and going forward. So I just wanted to have your insights on both these concepts of detection and kill of hypersonic weapons. Thank you very much. 
I, I think, uh, sir, you are well aware that uh, what are the uh, steps afoot for the detection part of it. The uh, detection capability merging with uh, what we presently have in the Indian Air Force along with the other agencies within the country who have got uh, ability to detect LEO and um, other space-based objects. So, the measures are afoot to now integrate them into the integrated air command and control system of the Indian Air Force so that we have complete airspace and space situational awareness at least within our AOR. And uh, defense against hypersonics, you know, globally there is nothing as of now. The whole world is seeking answers to how to defend against a hypersonic weapon. And um, I, I think um, I can leave it to the uh, Secretary DRDO to be able to answer as to what plans are afoot. But we are definitely taking it up as one of our futuristic projects. Uh, good morning, Air Chief. Thank you for the insights you've given us. Uh, my question relates to the business of structuring joint uh, theater commands, which uh, continue to be a sort of subject that the three services are grappling with. Uh, what do you regard as the Air Force's key interests in this particular exercise? And if it were left to you, what would you uh, sort of pin down or fight for as your specific theater command or a theater command in which the Air Force heads it? Thank you. I, I think uh, I've answered this uh, question to you some, some time back, maybe last year. I you asked me the sir, same question. I'll be asking this question for many years. <laughs> many years. And I think I'll give the same answer again and again, that, <laughs> that it is work in progress. Okay. And uh, primarily we are looking at, um, again, more than unity of command is unity of effects. Is Okay. Uh, um, sir, can I? Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for the recognition, sir. Uh, good, good morning, sir. It's an honor to be in your presence. So, recently, the chief of the United States, States uh, Space Force mentioned that there are threats beyond the planet, which, of course, he meant were countries creating defensive and offensive capabilities to target satellites. As the conversation flowed, I did uh, re refer to what uh, Major Gauravare was saying. How are we going to prepare for Space for which is a very uh, different domain as compared to land and sea? And secondly, what does the uh, Indian uh, countermeasures have since we do have enemies who wish to target our communication in satellite? You are aware of Mission Shakti of 2019, yes. where we have demonstrated our capability to carry out uh, a launch. Uh, however, this is the, the first step that we have taken. In future, what we should look at is instead of having purely land-based offensive systems, we should have space-based offensive systems also. This will reduce the response time, have a, you know, probably a, a greater effect and threaten more, um, you know, adversaries than what a land-based can do. Okay, so that is the future lies in having space-based offensive platforms. Uh, All right, uh, last two questions please only. Uh, good afternoon, Because sir. I think we've already taken up too much of the Chief's time. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, it's really overwhelming to uh, sit between among the uh, distinguished guests here. Uh, so it's a personality question. So are you a top gun guy or an iron man? <laughs> I think that's sorry. the toughest question, sir. <laughs> that's the toughest sorry. one. That is the toughest one. I'll leave it for you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> I saw your videos. It was an amazing video. So there's a question for that. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, uh, last question, please. Good afternoon, sir. A very enlightening uh, session. I'm Barkha Trihan from Delhi. Uh, sir, a very serious question which I want to ask you is what about the welfare of the army men? They go through lots of trauma. Men in uniform. So any policies for them? Are we looking into that? Of course, it is always that uh, one of our top priorities. The welfare of our troops remains uh, foremost in our minds at all times. During peace, during ops, whether they are in service or whether they are our veterans. So uh, we have uh, for the veterans, uh, all the three services have got a uh, robust organizational structure to meet the requirements. For example, the Air Force, we have an Air Force Association with, with uh, regional chapters in all the states. And uh, we have directorates of what we call Directorate of Air Veteran, Directorate of Army Veteran and so on. So we definitely uh, make take extra steps 
to ensure that the uh, welfare of the veterans is taken care of and of the serving troops it's a part of the it's a responsibility of the commanding officer and the uh, officers who are commanding troops and stations and bases to ensure that the welfare is taken care of so with uh, due respect i think much more needs to be done thank yes. you sir i look forward to suggestions from you yes what sir. can be done sure sir yeah. Yeah. uh thank you i think uh, <coughs> I'll take one. Oh, you'd like to take one more? Please. Last question. Right. Uh, so, since we have been talking about space so much, weaponization of space is not a new concept. As a matter of fact, uh, the Soviets had a very formidable system called FOPS, Fractional Orbital Bombardment System, which was operational from 60s till the 80s. Only the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaties brought it down. Why am I, my question is that uh, our friends in the East, the Chinese, took a defunct ship called Varyag and they converted it into their first aircraft carrier called the Liaoning. Can we at least ensure that they don't do this to something like FOBs? Because uh, the Russians, I'm sure, would sell anything right now. And if that happens, we have absolutely nothing to counter it. So, what do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is where the future is. I mean... Thank you, uh, right. Samir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you so it's much. It's an honor sir. and privilege, sir, to host you. Thank you. Thank you very much.